decades. We're not sure about the date, what's going to happen it's going, when it does. There's going to be abrupt climate change. There's going to be 200 mile an hour wind. It's coming. It's going to hit us. It's going to hit us hard. And there's going to be 200 mile an hour winds. And there's going to be massive tidal waves and earthquakes. What will be happening in the future with abrupt climate change? The science fiction is what's going to cause it. And the science fiction is human activity creating CO2 greenhouse gases. That's the science fiction. Because I did pretty quickly learn what would be causing the rising ocean levels and abrupt climate change. What I learned today is known by the major world governments. I doubt the president of Zimbabwe knows what we're going to talk about. But the heads of England, Canada, United States, Russia, China, they all know. And they're making preparations. The Vatican knows, and I have some local uh, connections there that I know how, about the Vatican and what they're doing. It's coming, it's going to hit us, it's going to hit us hard. And there's going to be 200 mile an hour winds. And there's going to be massive tidal waves and earthquakes and all the rest of all the things that you said. Because I did pretty quickly learn what would be causing the rising ocean levels and abrupt climate change. These men. On one of the breaks, I have a man walk up and introduce himself to me. He says, John, I'm in the insurance industry. And we've wondered for years, us in the insurance industry, why is there such a cluster of retired Navy people in the zip codes of the Arkansas Missouri Ozarks? Now I know. Now I got my answer. How many planets are there in our solar system? NASA. Never a straight answer. NASA. <laughs> July 29th, 2005, announced the finding of the 10th planet, named Xena. Do a Google search. There has to be a cause. The cause is the 10th planet. Now, what NASA is calling the 10th planet is not the 10th planet we're concerned about. It's the 10th planet that's referred to in the Bible, also called Wormwood. The closer you are to the current equator, whatever that might be, the better off you are when these things happen, if there's a pole shift, because your climate's not going to change all that much. If you're in Miami, Florida, and we have a 20-degree pole shift, you're not going to end up with a really, really bad winter. You're going to have a mild winter. But if you're in Maine, and you got a 20-degree pole shift, you could end up with the weather of Siberia real easy. And when this 10th planet comes through our solar system every 3,600 years, it just causes severe problems on our planet, interacting with the Earth electrically and with gravity both. Where is all this water going to come from? Up until last year, I was thinking, oh, melting ice at Antarctica, melting ice at Greenland. But that... How could it melt that fast? Well, it can't melt that fast, even with what we're going through. It turns out the answer was right in front of me all the time. There is a bulge of water at the equator. It turns out that sea level varies as much as 494 feet up and down from that rock in Cornwall, England. Now, that's like a 50-story building. I mean, that's a lot of water. And there's a bulge of literally millions of cubic miles, cubic miles, one mile by one mile by one mile, cubic miles, millions of cubic miles of water bulge at the equator of this planet. It wasn't common knowledge for John Moore, I found out. It may, it's not common knowledge for most people. It's held in place by two things, the rotation of the Earth and gravity. Anything that changes our true north, our pole, by more than just a couple of degrees, will cause that water to be disrupted. And there's a technical term for it, slush. <laughs> and there's records locked up in bones and stone of this having happened in the past. Velikowski talked about it extensively in his books. And, uh, you know, I guess we're at this point. Here we are. Just uh, basically see you on the other side. See you on the other side. And uh, some of you might know what that means. The rest have no clue. Well, what I got, I probably only got about three people who watch my videos anyway now. <laughs> they pulled them off of all their, oh, look at that. Wow, look, we got a, we got actual rain. There's some crazy happenings over here. Take a look at that. I didn't even see that. My lordy. Someone else in the background was probably like, uh, you didn't see that fucking idiot earlier? Shit, you were showing it to us. They saw it. <laughs> Probably. Okay, let's zoom in. Let's take a look. Wow. And there we are, the nasty storms, the lightning storm.
Let me balance this. Stop shaking. Okay, so we got, yeah, we got a storm. We got. Kind of weird, isn't it? Looks like all lit up. That's except that's the wrong direction, huh? Oh, I'm sure it's nothing. There's that damn uh, storm in between the two bright areas. It almost looks kind of like uh, two suns, don't it? Just playing around. Phase three will be a relatively short period of time. It may be a matter of a few days, maybe a week. It won't be long. At some point, people will realize that things are very strange and very dangerous, and they'll start doing things they normally wouldn't do. Most men, and it's mostly men because of the nature of the work they do, some women, who know about what we're talking about today just simply go about their lives and keep quiet about it. They're not public speakers, they take care of their family, they take care of themselves, and the rest of you are on your own. I mentioned Wisconsin will be gone. The Great Lakes will become one vast inland sea joining up with Hudson Bay up in Canada. That's what the Navy says. Gone, Wisconsin's gone. It's finished. There's, no, there's not going to be any more Wisconsin. Florida's gone. Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, finished, gone. Some science in there, some science fiction. The science is about what will happen in the future, abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels. The science fiction is what's causing it. It's not man-made greenhouse gases, like he says. That's a distraction. And that tactic was decided on many, many years ago, um, sometime in the late 70s, early 80s, that they would use that as the pretext to keep people thinking things are going to be okay. The science leaves out something, and the science fiction adds something. Al Gore gives a timeline for when these events are going to happen. Abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels. The timeline that Al Gore gives in his movie is the same timeline that the federal government gives out through the, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute. Say that fast ten times. The NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute, which the Queen, Her Majesty, visited last spring when she was in this country, by the way, because she's got a sudden, taking a sudden interest in science. It's kind of clever what they did in the movie, the way they said it. But in 2016, things will start to get bad, abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels. Exact same timeline put out by the federal government through NASA. NASA's part of the military, by the way. If you're noticing space flight, shuttles go up, captain this, lieutenant that, colonel, I mean, it's the military. It's always been the military. That's the official timeline put out by the federal government. 
Now, the real timeline. These relocations, which you could call evacuations, are due to have everybody who's part of continuity of government planning. It's not all federal employees. If you work for Health and Human Services, you're toast. There's no place waiting for you in Denver. People in the intelligence agencies, people in certain parts of the military, not all the military. The scientists, the engineers, the doctors that they want to have in these shelters when everything breaks loose. That's who's being relocated, that's who's being sent to these shelters. These shelters are literally hundreds of millions of your tax dollars where people can live and work and have hot showers and pizzas and video movies for years without ever leaving the place and be quite comfortable. And then what we sometimes refer to as a new world order, which will be uh, basically corporations running everything, banks and corporations, they fully expect to come out on the other side of this intact. The agendas of the people that control the world, the international bankers and the Fortune 500 and so forth, is to have a planet with far less people on it than there is now either inadvertently through these earth changes or by design through World War III, a flu pandemic, or severe economic collapse leading to societal disruption, are all three happening at the same time. What we're living in right now is, is phase one. Phase one is where normal commerce takes place. We can have our careers, interact with our families and, and our social events that we normally do, and life appears to be normal powers that be are using phase one to finish their final preparations. Phase two will be when these earth changes events, abrupt climate change, bizarre weather, earthquakes, tidal waves, all become so numerous that they become daily news. In fact, when I meet people out in the street, uh, almost everybody comments on how bizarre the weather has become. And that's pretty much a topic of daily discussion. The government, the powers that be, will claim that these bizarre weather-related events are related to global warming, and when they're happening, that we need to start cutting back on our creation of CO2 greenhouse gases. As these events become more severe, you're going to hear more and more men with lab coats from NASA talking about global warming being caused by human activity, and that it will be better and everything's going to be okay, so you can go back to your baseball games go back to work Monday morning. Things are going to be fine. That's phase two. Phase four will be the end of the world as we know it. Once these oceans come up, the infrastructure that supports normal human activity will be wiped out. The housing where 100 million people live will be damaged and or destroyed. The potable water that these people rely on will no longer be potable. The food that they rely on to eat will no longer be available. It will not be a pretty picture. Martial law will be instituted probably before that, which brings to mind these other scenarios. What are you looking at? You're looking at curfews. The curfew could be from 10 o'clock at night to 6 a.m. The curfew could be 24 hours a day. Restrictions of sales of uh, firearms, ammunition, and alcohol. Uh, rationing of fuel, rationing of food, potable water rationing, possibly uh, rationing of electricity. We've seen that in Iraq a lot, depending on what's going on. Martial law is not a fun thing to be part of or live under, even if you're part of the occupying force because it changes your life. And the Navy says these oceans will come up over a period of about 30 days. Once these events get in motion, these water levels, these oceans, these tsunamis, tidal waves will take place over a period of about one month. Altitude. The Navy says that everything 100 feet sea level and below will be completely destroyed. The Navy says everything at 400 feet and below is at risk of being damaged and or destroyed. But there's more to this. There is how close you are to densely populated areas. Now, the Appalachian Mountains, for example, in North Carolina and so forth, would be highly desirable places 
to be if it wasn't for being so close to literally tens of million people who are going to be hungry and without potable water and without electricity. That's what makes those areas undesirable, even though they will be safe in terms of geology and rising ocean levels. Dollars, if you, can, if you call dollars money, uh, you would be well advised to maybe be looking at something else for money to store up value for future use, possibly gold coins, possibly silver coins, to store up a lot of value in a compact area, compact space. Before, however, I would get gold coins or silver coins, I think I would look at other aspects of preparedness. That's why I want to focus on the final part of this presentation is preparedness. So let's look at the stepping stones, the building blocks of preparedness. First of all, and most important, is spiritual preparedness. That our American POWs, who were incarcerated in POW camps in World War II, our American POWs, who had strong spiritual beliefs, were far more likely to survive what went on in POW camps than those who did not. Eating the same food, having the same medical attention, doing the same work, wearing the same clothes, living in the same buildings. Those who had a strong spiritual foundation were far more likely to survive those conditions. We know that for a fact. It's not my job to tell you what your spiritual beliefs should be. My job is to tell you you need to have strong spiritual beliefs, whatever that might be for you. Next comes skills. The skills of a farmer, a gardener. You will be growing your own food. The skills of a paramedic. In a future where things no longer work like we're used to, you're going to be your own paramedic or are you going to sit there and watch your loved one bleed to death from a chainsaw accident or whatever it might be? An EMT course is one semester at your local junior college, maybe $100, $200, and you'll know more about emergency medical matters than 99% of the people in this country. One semester at your local junior college. You don't need to worry about passing a test unless you intend to be a paramedic or an EMT. You don't need to worry about taking a test at all. You want to learn the skills, and you want to get a kit equal to your skill level. Now, the paramedic training is three more, three more semesters of college on top of that first one. And then you'll have a skill level almost equal to a medical doctor when it comes to emergency medical treatment. The skills of a ham radio operator. I've been in places, I've been in combat, and I know what it's like not to know what's going on. Being able to instantly and effectively communicate with your friends and loved ones, we found this out during Hurricane Katrina, two-way radio communication that you control could mean the difference between life and death. In Hurricane Katrina, it was a matter of life and death for many people. The ability to communicate with their loved ones, let them know they were okay, ask for help, or be able to give help. The skills of a backpacker, being able to carry everything you need on your back, your shelter, your clothing, your hygiene needs, being able to clean yourself out in the field, prepare food out in the field, and do so in a manner that doesn't make you sick, being able to take water out of a stream and filter it so you can drink it without getting sick, all the things that a backpacker knows, the skills of a soldier. In a severe crisis like Hurricane Katrina, for example, you're your own cop, you're your own soldier, or nobody's protected. That's what it comes down to. You become your own soldier, you become your own police officer, and you protect your loved ones because of these skills that you learn. Animal husbandry. In a severe long-term crisis, having goats and sheep and chickens and ducks and rabbits can mean the difference between a fairly good and healthy diet and one that's terribly lacking in protein. It's extremely difficult to get the protein you need from an all-vegetable diet. Extremely difficult. The skills of a carpenter, of an electrician, of a plumber, things that we may call up a professional to do now, you, you will be on your own to make these repairs. The skills of an automobile mechanic. All these skills take years to learn, and you can't learn them out of a book, at least not and be very effective. There's some things you can learn out of a book, but without practical application, you're just guessing at how this stuff works. If you're choosing a place to live and thrive during a severe long-term crisis in the Ozarks, you may think, well, myself and my spouse, we can do this. Then I remind people who, th who are considering that of the number 168. 168 hours in a week, and in a severe long-term crisis, somebody's going to have to be awake 168 hours a week. Because no, t no people can do that, I suggest that at least six adults uh, 
come together and decide to shelter as a group. I also suggest that people have at least a two-year supply of food. Professor McCanny, in one of his books, his 60-page pamphlet about surviving Planet X, he mentions the need, the possible future need, to establish a new calendar. It goes something like this. If there would be a, a pole shift, it would change the seasons, it would change the calendar. In fact, within recorded history, the calendar has changed from 360 days to 365 days. That's, this has happened in the past. If it changes more than three or four weeks, though, here's what could happen. You could plant your seeds at the wrong time. If you plant your seeds at the wrong time and you can't go to the grocery store to get food, this could be a life-threatening situation. So you need to be able to know when the time to plant is so you don't plant at the incorrect time and end up losing all those valuable seeds. Dr. Velikowski was a medical doctor and he wrote uh, several books about these matters and he was hammered on mercilessly. One of the things Dr. Velikowski did was reconcile calendars, like when you reconcile your checkbook, and nobody had ever done this previously, and it's not easy to do, reconcile calendars from these ancient cultures. Dr. Velikowski made an observation. There is a passage in the Bible, the Israelis are having this battle, and they need a few extra hours to win this battle, and Guess what? They got a few extra, their day was a few hours longer. Well, it turns out we now know scientifically how that could happen, and the only way it could happen. For the Israelis to get three or four hours more daylight, the only way that can happen is for the planet to roll over in space, giving those extra four hours. Here's what Valakowski said. Well, if the sun didn't set over the Sinai Desert when it was supposed to, on that date, and he had the date because the Israelis had calendars and they wrote it down. That's a pretty important deal. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're Moses and something important happens, you tell the scribes, hey, write this down. This is important. So they had written records and they had a calendar. Velikowski said if that happened over the Sinai Desert, then the sun must not have come up in China the next morning when it was supposed to come up. And the Chinese had scribes, the Chinese had calendars, and guess what? The sun didn't come up the next morning when it was supposed to verifying scientifically the Bible and verifying scientifically what really happened. The Israelis did get that extra four hours of daylight and the Chinese didn't have the sun. Of course, they co the sun couldn't come up because the planet had rolled over in space. Now, Dr. Velikowski wrote a number of books. Now, well, I'm going to quote here word for word is a quotation from his, one of those books. It's titled Earth in Upheaval by Emanuel Velikowski. Now, what he's doing here is giving a, this is one page of one book, one page of one book. He's giving a very compact, highly condensed observation of what happens in a pole shift. Observations based on what he found going around the planet and finding the evidence. It's titled A Working Hypo Hypothesis. Let us assume as a working hypothesis that under the impact of a force or the influence of an agent and the Earth does not travel in an empty universe, the axis of the Earth shifted or tilted. At that moment, an earthquake would make the globe shudder. Air and water would continue to move through inertia. Hurricanes would sweep the Earth, and seas would rush over continents, carrying gravel and sand and marine animals, casting them on the land. Heat would be developed. Rocks would melt. Volcanoes would erupt. Lava would flow from fissures in the ruptured ground and covered vast areas. Mountains would spring up from the plains and would travel and climb on the shoulders of other mountains, causing faults and rifts. Lakes would be tilted and emptied. Rivers would change their beds. Large land areas with all their inhabitants would slip under the sea. Forests would burn. Hurricanes and wild seas would rust them from the ground on which they grew and pile them, branch and root, in huge heaps. The seas would turn into deserts, their waters rolling away. And if a change in the velocity of the Earth's rotation, slowing it down, should accompany the shifting of the axis, the water confined to the equatorial oceans by centrifugal force would retreat to the poles, and high tides and hurricanes would rush from pole to pole, carrying reindeer and seals to the tropics and desert lions into the Arctic, moving from the equator up and down the mountain ridges of Himalayas and down the African jungles, and crumbled rocks torn from splintering mountains would be scattered over large distances and herds of animals would be washed from the plains of Siberia. 
A shifting of the axis would also change the climate of every place, leaving corals in Newfoundland and elephants in Alaska, fig trees in northern Greenland, and luxuriant forests in Antarctica. In the event of a rapid shift of the axis, many species and genre of animals on land and in the sea would be destroyed, and civilizations, if any, would be reduced to ruins. Um, I can't stand here and prognosticate exactly what we're in for. I can tell you for a fact that the federal government has been spending hundreds of millions of your tax dollars getting ready for this since at least 1979, at least. The major governments know about this and are making preparations. China and Russia both know about this and are, are taking what precautions they think are important and need to be done. There's a lot of people and a lot of entities that know about this. My passion is to help people be safe. I've seen the consequences of not being prepared. I've seen violent death firsthand. I've smelled the bombs. I've seen the bleeding bodies. I've heard the screams of the people dying in agony. And it's not a fun place to be. My passion is to see people be safe. And I'll do anything I can to help people be safe and be prepared. That's my passion. That's why I'm up here doing this. Yes, it's weak. But as you get out in space, the properties of magnetism begin to alter. They do begin to alter. In fact, they increase um, exponentially as you begin to lose your atmosphere. Hey! Hey! The coldness of space actually intensifies the Earth's magnetic field the further you go out. So it can be one reading internally, which is very weak on the Earth's surface. But in space, it can be extremely strong extremely strong. Remember, when they first went out in space with men, they made a mistake not having the Earth's magnetosphere replicated on the craft. So the second, uh, the, the additional times they went out in space, they replicated the Earth's magnetic field in every craft that goes up. If not, the people go nuts. They, they go crazy. Hey! Hey! They lose uh, functionality of their uh, reasoning skills and everything else is gone and they revert back to this animalistic behavior. They lose uh, functionality of their uh, reasoning skills and everything else is gone and they revert back to this animalistic behavior. Hey! Hey! But we're going to see a cluster of impacts. Now this is not pertaining to earthly wars and things because there is a war forming but as far as space is concerned, we're going to have a cluster of impacts we're going to have to entertain. Uh, we were doing some immediate tracking, and it could be here before May. Before May. Yeah. The reason why the reason why there's a they're not quite sure yet is because now we have objects in this cluster crashing into each other. You're you're looking at it now. As far as speed goes, you're looking at somewhat of a constant, but their vectors are changing. Their trajectories are changing. Uh, it's like a pool table. I mean, they're going all over the place. Hey! Hey! Some will be spread out, some will concentrate. And so now, uh, it, it's a far worse scenario than I thought before. Hey! Hey! Because they're coming from, um, actually, they broke through the uh, belts of rock that we have in our solar system. We have two. They, they just totally uh, broke through those. The very dark objects behind them too, but they're coming in our way. Outer, uh, there's an outer asteroid belt and there's an inner asteroid belt. Right. In the outer one, it already broke through. It's disrupting the secondary. See, when it dislodges these rocks, they're going all over the place. Hey, hey. Um, as it comes in towards the sun, there, there's no way we're going to be out of its path. That's the scenario we're looking at. We'll see it with Mars first. See, when Mars is hit, when they're hit, and that surface of that planet's obliterated, we're next. That means we're about uh, a few few days, maybe a week off. Uh, then we yep. get it. Or See, when these objects started crashing into each other, some slowed down, some sped up, and so they have to do what's called a retract on everything now. Right. And believe me, that, that's some supercomputer crunching that's going on right now because it's really worrying everybody. So everybody's in a rush to get everything done, to get everybody accounted for and secure. Hey! Hey! They need, they need people secure. Continuity of government 
uh, is going to be a uh, very hot topic. A few short hours ago, people thought the world was coming to an end. No, we're good. Getting a district. But this was an email warning from Oregon uh, Senator Brian Boquest. Okay, so here we go. It's an email from Senator Brian Boquist. There's his email address. It was written on September 8, 2016 at 3.23 p.m. Emergency preparedness. The state and federal government are not prepared for a major catastrophic emergency in the Northwest. We will likely never be prepared, thus you and your community must prepare yourselves. Weather is a Cascadia event, tsunami, volcano, pandemic, terrorist attack, or grid overload does not matter. In almost every single potential event, the power grid is down for weeks, if not months. Besides power outage, it means communication is out. Your cell phone goes dead the first day. Potable water stops flowing. Sewage is no longer pumped. There is no power to pump fuel into any vehicles. There are no grocery stores. Bridge failures in many events with, will island several million Oregonians for multiple weeks, if not months. Prepare for at least a month. FYI. We have conducted drills again this past June, along with increased planning. This update is a result of those drills as key state of federal emergency management officials were clear that life and death for many Oregonians may well rest upon individuals and local non-government community preparation. If you want a very good read on the possible scenarios, Look no further than Ted Koppel's recent book, Lights Out, A Cyber Attack, A Nation Unprepared, Surviving the Aftermath. The book and free sum summaries are available online. How do you prepare? Many people say they cannot afford to prepare for an emergency. Many people look at Red Cross and other, other lists, then revert back to the thought it is too expensive for me to be prepared that is the purpose of this email newsletter if you want a detailed perfect plan you can google the red cross or fema or a dozen web pages offering expensive solutions yeah expensive solutions. Well, i will outline some economic imperfect solutions you should consider since the government will not be coming to rescue you at the beginning of any catastrophic event. Most of you have a large quantity of items already. Think about it. The minimum is you will need to stay dry and warm, drink water, eat food, defecate, and stay sanitary to avoid disease. Yes, there are other items like a flashlight, radio, good book, etc., but chances are these already exist in your home, apartment, or car. 
stay dry and warm even in an earthquake portions of your residence may still be waterproof you may already have a camping tent if you have a tent then you likely have a sleeping bag if not you have bedding and blankets already an extra blanket is twelve dollars and twenty nine cents from walmart online today remember you have extra clothes and blankets that can be used both for warmth and sanitation if you decide to leave your damaged home make sure you take items to stay warm and dry also remember the neighboring town may be worse off than yours drink water medical professionals claim you need 9 to 15 cups of water per day there are 16 cups in a gallon most people drink nowhere near even nine cups per day on five dollar friday at safeway it is 89 cents per gallon of bottled water in most of the above emergencies you may have running water for a few minutes or hours or better think water immediately after the first trauma fill the bathtub fill empty containers fill extra bottles buckets or cooking pans immediately if you do not have a cache of water it rains in oregon put out a two dollar and ninety seven homer bucket from home depot homer is the rain worse comes to worse the highest excuse for not preparing i hear is i cannot afford any extra food Usually the person telling me this excuse is standing next to their SUV with their 199, 299, or 399 iPhone in their hand, sometimes with manicured nails or wearing a $300 hunting jacket. Many preppers buy expensive long-term storage items. Oddly, some people will starve to death in a couple of weeks simply because they do not like the taste of the food. Yes, you should rotate food if at all possible. I think some of you may detest places like the Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, Dollar General, Walmart, etc., or where Mart it's gone while many of you are regular shoppers. My walk through Dollar Tree last week was enlightening. Even a SS1, there are food items that can be bought, eaten, and rotated very inexpensively. Likewise, I say 25 pounds of rice at places like Costco, Walmart, United Grocers, and Walmart for around $15 in the past two weeks. Add 25 bouillon cubes I saw online for $1.58 gives you a start since both items have long shelf lives. At this time a year, United Grocers Cash and Carry has 50 pound bags of potatoes for less than 10 bucks. Likewise, 50 pounds of onions is less than 10 bucks too. But yeah, well, how in the hell is that going to last, you know? I list onions as the British Navy and modern Third World armies have stayed in the field living on onions due to its characteristics, all for 10 bucks. Chances are you already have salt and pepper in your cupboard. Worst case, a 24-pack of cup of noodles is $8.29 at Costco for or $9.95 online plus Walmart, etc., Western Family has case sales every fall. Many canned goods can be eaten straight from the can, like pre-cooked corn, uh, GMO, okay, beans, ravioli, etc. Yes, buy healthy if you can, can according to doctors, but do not starve to death if you have to buy what you will eat and can afford to store. Food and water heating. Yes, was not on the list above. Yes, you should boil unpure water if possible. Yes, at least some hot food is the best plan for a, men a month menu. Again, cost is always raised. Amazon lists a one-burner propane stove for seventeen eighty-eight from Coleman. Target is sixteen ninety-nine. Websterant store 
is 1099. Fuel canisters average 347 for a canister or two for 624. Your existing pots and pans will work just fine. Walmart or any sporting goods store has these items. Your barbecue might be the answer too. Also, you already have at least a few pots and pans already along with silverware most likely. If expense is the problem, buy one item a month until prepared. Again, plan for a month. Um, well, <laughs> what's a month going to do you when they talk about it being out for months? You know, with an S at the end of it. All right, defecate and stay sanitary. Few talk about this issue oddly. In a Cascadia event, this value will likely lead to disease and death much larger than initial casualties. In non-modern armies, this was the leading cause of death. Over 400,000 deaths in the Civil War were disease-related. Tens of millions died in World War II of disease. Think about it. There will be no running water, no flushing toilets, no bathing water, and how will you stay clean? You may have toilet paper, but where are you going to defecate? If the sewer is still connected, it may be the bucket of rainwater if you have enough. Or you may need to dig a hole in the ground away from your water source, then designate it the place everyone in the family uses to defecate. Use a bucket, worst case. What? Worst case? Okay. If not, disease is likely to start, which quickly leads to deaths later. Clorox handy wipes are $2.29 online at jet.com. Staples has a four-pack of wipes for $6. Likewise, a bar of soap with a wet towel can be used. Bleach is a must-have on my list. Buck a gallon a dollar at Dollar Tree. Bleach can be a miracle drug in stopping disease and a disaster. In the Army, we said if you take care of your feet, your feet will take care of you. In a long-term power outage, you will need to stay clean by washing even by wet cloth. You will need to change clothes. In the old days, people used the same set of work clothes for many days, then change to cleaner one, uh, non-work clothes at the end of the day. You at least will need to be prepared to wash under garments such as socks by hand. Let me remind you, most of the world population is still washing clothes by hand. Note, I did not ta talk about brushing teeth and other routine items since you will have plenty of time to dig through the potential rubble to find the tube of crest along with your toothbrush. Get away bags. Emergency management professionals all recommend having a small bag in your car or office for an emergency. This bag is not a live-all, save-all bag in any manner. It is meant as a bag to get you home or to safety. The place you go will depend upon where you are at the time of the event, but you likely will be walking, so you are not going to going very far fast. And most roads will be closed in any catast catastrophic natural disaster. My wife has a $10 backpack in her car. It is simple. Walking shoes, jacket, sweatpants in case she was wearing a dress, a large water bottle, flashlight, and a few walking items. She keeps a few snack bars and extra water in the car, too. Her plan is simple. Call home before your cell tower batteries go or generators die. Leave a message or tell whomever where she is at and she is walking home. The reasoning is simple, too. Likely, she would be in Salem if a Cascadia earthquake happened. It is a hundred miles to any place in eastern Oregon, which would be overwhelming with starving refugees after the four-day walk. But it is a 22 miles um, home to a month's supply of everything. If it is a power grid failure, as outlined, 
in Ted Koppel's book, it would be 500 to 800 miles to anything called civilization, safety, and security. After nearly four decades as a special forces officer, my experience tells me it is going to be very uncivilized in a long-term catastrophic event, to say the least. If this issue is concerning, my recommendation is to find a combat veteran you might know to discuss this topic with you at length. With no due disrespect, law enforcement is not the right place to seek answers as they will be overwhelmed. Therefore, suggest you reach out to one of Oregon's 325,000 veterans for suggestions on how to prepare for safety and security in a catastrophic event. My legislative update is not meant to alarm you or provide anything but suggestions on how you prepare for an emergency. It is meant for you to act. And that's in bold letters underlined. In June of 2016, a half dozen legislators attended the most recent national drill for catastrophic events for which Oregon participated. Three of the most senior emergency response officials from Oregon and the United States government agreed on one thing very loud and clear. Individuals will be on their own for a very long time, and survival of many will depend purely on local communities working together. Nobody should expect someone to arrive on their doorstep after a catastrophic natural disaster or grid failure saying, I am here to help you. I am from the government. You need to be prepared to take care of yourself, your family, and hopefully your neighbors for the first few weeks or months. Sincerely, Brian Boquest, State Senator, Chairman, Veterans and Emergency Pro